Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me on the left? Hear me in the middle? Hear me on the right? All right, good. So I'm here to talk to you about storytelling. And before I tell you anything about my subject or about me, I want to find out something about you. I have a question for everybody in this room. Here's the question. I'm curious, right now, today, when you talk about your work to people outside of your office, how often are you telling stories? I'm going to put four choices up here on the screen. I want you to take a look at all four choices, and then I want you to raise your hands. We'll do a quick survey of the room, OK? So we'll get a snapshot of where you are. All right, so your first choice is rarely or never. You, you are a numbers person. You're a data person. You're using the, the numbers club. Uh, and if that's who you are, that's fine. You can just own that. Second choice is occasionally. You're what I like to call story curious. Maybe you experimented with it in college. I don't know. <laughs> Third choice is frequently. You really do tell stories on a regular basis. And your fourth choice is all the time. And you're thinking, do I even need to stay for this session? <laughs> so given those four choices, and please be honest, how many people here would say, show of hands, rarely or never? It's just not something I do. It's just not who I am. Anybody? Nobody? All right. Who would say occasionally, every once in a while? Occasionally. OK. Who would say frequently? That looks like that may be the biggest group. Who would say all the time? Really? Really? OK, you all the time people, you can go. <laughs> <laughs> Sit down. I'm kidding. <laughs> I love people taking me seriously. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm gratified to see so many of you in the frequently and the all the time category. Uh, because the other reason I do that survey is uh, I got an hour of your time this morning. But when that hour is up, when, we're, when I'm done, I would like every single person in this room at the end of that hour to be thinking to themselves, I have to be in the all the time category. That this tool, too powerful, too valuable for me not to be finding a way to use it every day. So that's what I'm shooting for. So who am I and what qualifies me to teach you about storytelling? Well, you heard a little bit of my background, but uh, we left out sort of the, the most important point, which is sort of my education. How did I learn about storytelling? So let me give you my CV. So I was educated at the Walt Disney Jim Henson School of Storytelling. And if you're thinking, gosh, I didn't know there was a Walt Disney <laughs> Jim Henson School of Storytelling. There isn't. I just made that up. Um, however, in the early 1990s, there was a television show that was a Walt Disney Jim Henson co-production. And I was a writer on that show. And I was a writer for three seasons of this, of this show. It was on the ABC network. Um, and I can tell you, if you want to learn a thing or two about storytelling, you could do worse than to work for the Walt Disney and Jim Henson people. They know a thing or two about how to tell a good story. And if you're wondering, well, what show was that, Andy? Well, this was 20 years ago. And this being a room full of intelligent adults, you probably never saw it. But just for the record, it was a show called Dinosaurs on ABC. <laughs> Anybody remember the show? Really? Yes? Where were you 20 years ago? <laughs> and they're handing out, those Niel <laughs> handing out those Nielsen boxes. Now, a funny thing about this show, and, and see if, prove me if I'm, if I'm wrong here. So I was one of eight writers on this show. And we, the writers, thought we were writing this very witty social satire using dinosaurs to make fun of human beings. But 20 years later, when I meet people who remember the show, the only thing they remember, the only thing, is that the baby dinosaur used to refer to its mother as mama, and used to refer to its father as? Mama. <laughs> See, I'm embarrassed for you. <laughs> for anyone who doesn't remember, I actually have a short clip, so let's roll the video. Here we go. Want to give daddy a kiss? Not the mama, not the mama, not the mama, not the mama, not the mama. That is starting to bother me. See, like I said, Witty social satire. <laughs> so I was on that show for three seasons, learned an awful lot about storytelling. Uh, also learned that the TV business was not for me. So <laughs> I quit that job uh, after three years, and I went to work for a nonprofit uh, started by Norman Lear and some of his friends in Hollywood called the Environmental Media Association, or EMMA. And the whole idea behind EMMA 
was to work with writers and producers of TV shows and movies, trying to convince them to put environmental messages into their storylines. So the idea being, you're sitting at home watching your favorite primetime show, and all of a sudden, the characters are talking about recycling, <laughs> or global warming, or what have you. So I ran that organization for five years, and that got me into the nonprofit world in uh, Southern California. And I started to meet lots of nice people at nonprofits, foundations, government agencies, in all fields, environment, health, education, uh, you name it. And what I found out about those people, really, I sort of came to two conclusions about those people, which includes you. Number one is, I thought to myself, well, here's where all the nice people are. You know, here are people who have dedicated their lives to making the world a better place in some way, shape, or form. But the other thing I learned was these people were highly educated in their respective fields, passionate about what they did, but when it came to talking about what they did to people outside their fields, not so good at it. Not so good at it. So uh, 1998, 21 years ago in May, I started my own firm called the Goodman Center with the express purpose of helping people at nonprofits, foundations, government agencies, communicate more clearly and more effectively with all the people they needed to reach, primarily through storytelling. Um, and as you just heard, I've been leading workshops around the country and around the world, over 500 workshops over the last 21 years, for nonprofit organizations like these, foundations and government agencies like those, colleges and universities, and some corporate clients as well. This is just a sampling of some of the groups we've worked with. But the more important thing is, that what came back to us from these groups, they said, when we finally figured out what our stories were and started to tell them consciously, consistently, deliberately, they said it didn't just incrementally improve our communications, they said it transformed our communications. And that's what I'd like to see happen for you today uh, in this next hour. I'd like to see, I'd like to have you kind of rethink how you communicate about what you do. And so that's what's taken me from my home in Los Angeles to beautiful Franklin, Tennessee, uh, to be with you today. So that's my story in a nutshell. Now let me tell you our story, what we're gonna do in this next hour, and what some of us are gonna continue to do this afternoon. First, I think storytelling is the most powerful tool you have available to you, bar none. Uh, and I wish I could show you all the research I've seen over the years. There's just tons of research showing that stories are uniquely powerful. We don't have time for all of it. But I've picked one research study and one campaign that I think say the two most important things about storytelling. I'm going to present those to you. And hopefully by the end of that, you'll be nodding your head and saying, OK, maybe a little more here than I thought. So that'll bring us to part two, which is how do I do it? If I want to tell a memorable and persuasive story about my work, something that sticks in someone's head and actually changes the way they think and behave, how do I make sure I'm telling a story with all the trimmings? So we'll talk about that. And then lastly, what kinds of stories should you tell? There are about, uh, let's see, I actually wrote this down. Uh, we've got five categories of stories. I'm not sure if it covers everything, but I think it covers a lot of territory. I'm going to lay those out for you, and that's going to be your homework going forward. If you truly take what I say today seriously, uh, you're going to go out and start collecting these stories, filling these buckets with stories. OK? So that's what we're going to do. Is that clear? Does that make sense? Yes? OK. I'm like the flight attendant who says, I need a verbal response. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yes. All right, good. Now, a couple of ground rules. Uh, number one, if you're thinking, should I be taking notes? Can I get a copy of the slides? Where are the slides? How do I get the slides? Um, I'm going to give a copy to Tim, and uh, he's going to make sure that you can get them. So anybody who wants anything up on the screen, it's yours. And my second rule is, if at any point I say something that's confusing, uh, you're skeptical, I think I'm full of shit, whatever, raise your hand and let's deal with it. Uh, I don't want you stuck while we're moving along. So you got a question, something's unclear, raise your hand, I'll call on you. There's a room small enough I can see you. My teaching philosophy, no adult left behind. OK? So let's do this together. All right. So why is storytelling so powerful? Here's the first argument. Number one, stories help us remember. And just stop and think about this for a second. If somebody tells you something and you forget it, you know, in one ear, out the other, game over. 
that information has no chance to affect you ever again, right? But if somebody can tell you something in a way that makes it stick in your brain and stay there, that's important. That changes the game. And stories have that power. And there was a study done in 19, I forget when it was, 1976, I think, with five-year-olds at the University of Minnesota that illustrates this beautifully. And to tell you about this study, it would be very helpful if somebody in this room, or a couple of people, had in their life now a five-year-old, son, daughter, niece, nephew, right there. Five-year-old child, sir? Name of the child? Karis. Karis? Is that a boy or a girl? Girl. Girl, OK. Um, so is Karis in preschool or kindergarten? kindergarten? All right, so I want you to picture this. You, but everybody, everybody else. So one day in Karis's kindergarten class, the teacher says, Gather around, kids. We have a special visitor today from the University of Minnesota, and she wants to play a fun game with you. So please give her your attention. And the researcher steps forward and says, hi, hi kids, hi. I want to play a fun game with you to test your memories. Here's how the game works. I'm going to hold up cards, like you see on the screen, with two sides, two panels. And there's going to be pictures of two things, like this. She holds up the first card, and on the left, there's a bar of soap, and on the right, there's a shoe. And she says to the kids, in this game, that's our first pair. Soap goes with shoe. Can you remember that? Karis, can you remember that, soap and shoe? You're Karis. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> yes, very good. Thank you, Karis. Good, soap and shoe. OK, now I'm going to open another card. She holds up another card, and this one has, let's say, a baseball bat and a bucket of paint. She says, I want you to remember soap and shoe and bat and paint. That's our second pair. Karis, you still with me? Yes. Very good. Hold up a third card. This one has a daisy on the left and a cloud on the right. She says, I want you to remember soap and shoe, bat and paint, daisy and cloud, Karis. <laughs> Stay with me. And she holds up for the kids 21 cards, 21 pairs for the five-year-olds to remember. And when she's all done, she said, OK, there's a lot for you to take in, I know. So I want you kids to go out and play in the play playground for an hour. An hour. 60 minutes later, the kids come back. She says, all right, kids, gather around, gather around. She says, now here comes the second half of the game. This is the really fun part. I'm going to hold up the cards again with the two pictures. But this time, one of the pictures is going to be missing. And you have to tell me what's missing. So you get the scenario? One hour later, 21 pairs. How many can the five-year-olds reconstruct? So just Karis's dad. One hour later, 21 pairs. On average, in the group, how many do you think the kids were able to put back together? The first two. The first two. That's a very good guess. In fact, it was the first one. <laughs> right. It was just one. And most parents of five-year-olds will say two or one or zero, or would they even remember they saw the cards? You know, <laughs> Because let's face it. They're five, all right? All right, we're just getting started. Our researcher now goes to another school on another day, completely new group of kids. You have a five-year-old, too? I saw your hand go up. Yeah. Name of your child? Cole. Sorry? Cole. Cole. That would be a boy. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so in Cole's class, she has the same 21 cards I just told you about, but this time there's a twist. This time, as she holds up each pair, she says to the kids, I want, I'm going to call on one of you to put the words in a sentence for the whole class to hear. So the first card goes up, soap and shoe, and she says, Cole, would you please put the word soap and shoe in a sentence for the whole class to hear whenever you're ready? Uh, sure. If he's a five-year-old boy, it'd probably be, there was poop on the shoe, so I needed the soap to wash it off. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Also very articulate for five. <laughs> there was poop on the shoe, so I needed the soap to wash it off. Okay. You know, I want to tell you something. I've done this 500 times. Never heard that sentence. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The kids make 21 sentences out of each pair. They go out in the playground again. They play for an hour. She brings them back and tests them. Compared to the first group, which only got one, how do you think Cole's group did? Same, better, or worse? He did much better. How much? Between 1 and 21, where do you think they ended up? I would say about 15. No, not quite. 8 out of 21, pairs remembered. Okay. 
one more group, one more day. Somebody on this side of the room, five-year-old son, daughter, niece, nephew, grandchild. Nephew, nephew name? Henry. Henry. Okay, so in Henry's class, same 21 pairs, but this time, here's the twist. Please put the words in a sentence that asks a question. So, five-year-old Henry, would you please put the words soap and shoe in a sentence that asks a question whenever you're ready? Why was the soap in a shoe? Perfect. Why was the soap in a shoe? The kids hear 21 questions, go out and play for an hour, bring them back and test them, compared to the first two groups, one, eight. How do you think Henry's group did? Same, better, worse? Yeah. Huh? Even better. 16 out of 21 pairs remembered. Now, assuming these are all equally intelligent five-year-olds, you tell me, what did the researchers conclude was happening in these kids' brains by virtue of hearing questions that was happening not so much when they just heard a sentence and almost not at all when they just saw the pairs? I'm serious, I'm asking. What do you think was happening in their brains? Raise your hands if you think you know. What was happening? Coming up with an answer. Number one is that when someone asks a question, even if the question isn't asked directly to you, we all do it. We all come up with an answer. We all respond. So first of all, there's a higher level of engagement. They have to do something. By the way, this is why so much advertising asks questions. Have you ever noticed that? You're driving down the highway, you pass a billboard. It says, wouldn't you like to be in Paris right now? And you're like, yes, yes I would. <laughs> you know? So with a question like, what's the soap doing in my shoe, the kids have to answer it. And to answer it, they'll think, well, you know, little uh, Karis put it in there while I wasn't looking. And they'll start to construct in their minds the rudiments of a right, where somebody is doing something to somebody else and there's an outcome. So triggered by questions, there was a higher level of engagement. Their little minds started to percolate. And while they were out there in the playground for an hour, they started to come up with stories to answer the question. So that when they brought him back in the room and she holds up the first card that only has the soap on it, Henry's sitting there thinking to himself, soap, soap. Oh, that's right, Karis put the soap in my shoe. Shoe! And he had the other half of the pair. And they did it 16 out of 21 times. So the takeaway from this study and this is relevant to every single person in this room. If you've got some facts about your work that you want people to remember, it is much more likely they'll remember those facts if they're contained within a story than if you just give them the facts. Stories help us remember. That's number one. Second, stories can change how we think and how we behave. And just take a moment to think about this for a second. Right now in your brain are thousands of stories about the way the world works. And every situation you encounter, every new situation, new person, you pull out the story to say, have I been through this before? Does this match up? If it does, okay, this makes sense. We'll let the information in. And if it doesn't make sense, then your guards are up. You may not let the information in. You may say, this, I've never seen this before. I don't know what this is. So to get people to change their behavior, sometimes we have to change the stories in their heads. We have to change the software running their brain. And to really fully explain what I'm talking about here, I want to give you an example from the field of organ donation. Now, I know this is not your work, but you can all relate. How many people here, show of hands, have signed up to be organ donors? Raise your hands and hold them up for a second. That looks to be about mm, 60, 70% of the room. Very good. The national average in the US, about 56%. A little more than half will sign up and do it. About 44% won't. The people who don't, the people who refuse to sign up, given the option to be organ donors, some people have medical excuses and can't. Okay, so they're, they're just clear. But some people don't sign up because they have a very strong story in their head about why organ donation is wrong for them. And who can tell me, and don't be afraid to guess because you're going to be right, what are the stories, what are the reasons people give why they're not going to donate their organs. Who wants to tell me one of the top reasons? Come on, you know this right here. Because if you're in the hospital and something bad happens to you, the doctors are less likely to try to save your life. Number one answer. Doctors won't work as hard to save me. Or the emergency medical services won't work as hard to save me. It's like, you know, God forbid, I finish with you today, I get in the, uh, the uh, car to go back to the uh, airport, and we're in an accident. 
and the ambulance comes to get me. Let's rush this guy to the hospital, quick, he's hurt bad. Oh wait, he's an organ donor? Take the long way, <laughs> you know? That's right, we need the kidney. Number one answer, doctors won't work as hard to save me. Good, what else? Come on, you know this. What other reasons people give? Come on, you know. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's sort of in the same category. It's like they're, they're a little too eager to take the organs there. What's another one? Come on, give me another one. I'm praying for another answer. Religious beliefs, right. When I go to meet my maker, I need to be all there, right? That's right. How do I see St. Peter if I donate my eyes, right? Uh, that's, that's the two of the top four. Here are the top four. Take a look. Won't work as hard to save me. Oh, I'm too old. You know, you could be as old as 80 in many cases, donate your organs. And then my favorite, that my organs won't go to the most deserving person, that some rich or famous person will jump the line. You know, it's like my, my liver will go to a Kardashian, that type of thing, right? <laughs> and who wants that, right? <laughs> That's right. Nothing against the Kardashians. I'm sure they're, they're all fine people. Um, None of these stories are true. Not one is true. But people believe this stuff. So if, if you no longer work for, if for the Forest Service, any type of forest organization, you're no longer in the woods, you're now, we're all working for Donate Life America. Our job is to get more people to donate their organs. Because I said 56%, not nearly enough. So we have to convince more people to donate. But this is what people think. So we've got to change their minds. So how do we do that? Well. <clears throat> The data heads out there might say, show them the numbers. The numbers are compelling. Well, let me show you the numbers, because they are compelling. This is right from, this is from DonateLife.net. Look at that number on the top there. 120,000 people in the US currently on a waiting list for an organ of some kind, OK? The need so far exceeds the supply that, see that number in the middle? 22 people die every day waiting for an organ that's never coming. That's 22 tragedies a day. But here's the thing. Those people without those stories that I just told you about, if you hit them with those numbers, you know what they say? What do you think they say? They say, gosh, that's, that's a shame. That is really too bad. Really sorry to hear it. But doctors won't work as hard to save me, religious belief, too old, Kardashian, whatever. They got their reasons, and they're not changing their minds. So what do we do? If, if data doesn't do it, how do we change their minds? Right. We have to give them a more powerful story. We've got to change the software up here that's saying no. And this was done in a campaign and done brilliantly in Brazil. In the town in the red box there, it looks like Recife, pronounced in Portuguese, it's Recife. Now, whether you've ever been to Recife, you ever been to Brazil, you ever been to South America, or you've never been, I'll bet you still know that everyone in Recife Everyone in Brazil, everyone in South America, they're all crazy for the same thing. Just nuts for the same thing. What is it? Or what they call football, what the world calls football. And in Asifi, if you go to Asifi, this is the local team, Sport Club do Asifi. You see that lion with the three stars up there? That's their logo. That's everywhere in town. You can't miss it. People in this, in this city, they love this team. They would die for this team. Well, hold on. There's a thought. If they would die for the team, would they donate their organs for the team? Well, believe it or not, this was the genesis of a campaign where they went to the fans of this team specifically, and they said, if you're truly a fan of this team, we want you to sign up for an organ donor card based on the team. Here it is, here's the organ donor card, and there's the logo of the team, see it there? It's proving that you're a true fan, you're actually donating your organs on behalf of the team. And here's where the story, here's where the, it really gets interesting. They said, here's the story they told them. If you're truly a fan of this team, and God forbid you die, but you pass on your organs to someone else, your fandom lives on forever. <laughs> you become an immortal fan. That was the name of the campaign, Immortal Fans. And they said, by the way, they said, if you donate your organs and they go into the body of someone who roots for a rival team, you turn them into a fan of our team. Now, look, you laugh and you think, that's funny. That's, uh, oh, those silly Brazilians, right? <laughs> this campaign was wildly successful. 
wildly successful. And I want to show you a short video that chronicles that success. So let's take a look. Amaro, Amaro, tengo coração torcida, não tem. O resto é resto, esmuda é tudo. Primeiro teste, segundo esporte, terceira família e quarto tanto trabalho. que os seus olhos vão continuar assistindo o esporte. Que os seus pulmões continuarão inspirando pelo esporte. Prometo que o seu coração sempre baterá pelo esporte. Hoje a maior dificuldade que existe no processo de doação é o sim da família. Eu sou rubro negra até depois de morrer, irmão. Tem a alma é rubro negra. Ainda mais que quando eu doar meus órgãos, ou meu pulmão for pro cara do Náutico, torcedor do Náutico, ele vai respirar o esporte. A campanha atingiu números impressionantes. 51 mil torcedores se declararam doadores. Uma quantidade superior à capacidade da Ilha do Retiro. A campanha do esporte, eu não tenho dúvida alguma que se viu para que, aumentando a oferta de doadores, a gente conseguisse zerar essa lista, conseguisse realizar o transplante em todos que estavam precisando. Uma campanha de doação de órgãos lançada pelo esporte está ajudando a salvar a vida de muitos torcedores. Antes do vídeo eu tinha passado 18 anos diabético e 5 anos fazendo uma viagem. E a vida só está melhorando, minha visão está voltando aos pouquinhos. Eu, tô, eu renasci de novo. Olha, já tem provado coração para sua mãe. Você pode trazer ela, isso com certeza. Fiquei aliviado de saber que eu ainda iria poder ter ela. Isn't that amazing? Uh, now over 60,000 people have signed up for these, uh, for these cards. Um, and you saw the waiting list for heart and corneal transplants drop to zero. But don't lose the larger point here, because we're not talking about organ donation. We're not talking uh, about, uh, about soccer. We're talking about how people's minds work. And I want to recommend a book to you uh, called Thinking Fast and Slow. It's about how people's minds work. And if you don't want to read the whole book, then let me give you the biggest takeaway from this book, written by this guy, Daniel Kahneman, who won the Nobel Prize, by the way, in economics for this book. And here's what he says. No one ever made a decision because of a number. They need a story. The way I like to put it is this. If you're in the business of changing the world for the better, I do believe that's everybody in this room. If you're in the business of changing the world for the better, you are first in the business of changing the stories in people's heads about the way the world works. And let me bring it home for you. Think about the people that you need to reach in your work. Not the people who are you know, inside the tent, who love you, support you, and are listening you know, full on. And not the people who, you know, metaphorically speaking, are so far outside the tent, they're never coming in. We're talking about the people who are sort of on the fence, who are thinking, do I want to be part of this or not? And here's my point. If these are the stories in their heads right now about the way the world works, no amount of data is going to change their mind. You have to give them 
a more powerful story. Stories help us remember. Stories influence how we think and behave, making them, I submit to you, the most powerful tool in your toolbox, bar none. So that's the case for storytelling. So part two, if I've convinced you that this tool is so important, now it's like, all right, how do we do it? How do we make sure when we tell a story about our work, it's got all the essential elements so that it's memorable and persuasive? And for this part, I always think, you know, steal from the best, learn from the masters. So when I look for good storytelling, I look to people like Disney and Henson and Pixar, particularly in this case, Pixar in this movie Up. Show of hands, how many people saw this movie? Yeah, that's why it made a billion dollars. Um, if you remember the movie, you might remember that the first six minutes of the movie is a complete, discreet story about a couple from the moment they meet as children to the moment that they part. And it's not the whole movie, it's only the first six minutes, but it's a whole story with all the elements. So I figure if we're gonna learn about storytelling, let's watch a really good story. So we're gonna watch the first six minutes of Up, okay? And for those of you who remember it well, have a Kleenex handy, <laughs> right? Um, we may need to put the volume up a little bit on this one. I'll also warn you, the first couple, first few seconds are kind of dark. You might be going, oh, am I gonna be able to see this? It gets brighter, so bear with me. But let's all watch up. Here we go. Hey, kid! <laughs> ah, thought you might need a little cheering up. I got something to show you. I am about to let you see something I have never shown to another human being ever in my life. You will have to swear you will not tell anyone. Cross your heart. Do it. My adventure book. You know him. <gasps> Charles Munz, explorer. When I get big, I'm going where he's going. South America. It's like America. I don't know where I'm gonna live. Paradise Falls, a land lost in time. I ripped and, uh, this right out of the library uh, book. When you, when you <gasps> I'm gonna move my clubhouse there and park it right next to the falls. Where you talk about Who knows so what lives up, up there? New accounts and once I get room. there, I well, just... I'm saving these pages for all the adventures I'm gonna have. Only. I just don't know how I'm going to get to Paradise Falls. That's it! You can take us there in a blimp! Swear you'll take us! Cross your heart! Cross it! Cross your heart! Good, you promised. No backing out. Well, see you tomorrow, kid. Bye! Adventure is up there! You know, you don't talk very much. I like you. Wow.
All right. In this story, as in any story, there are certain questions you have to answer for the audience. If somebody comes up to you, business meeting, party, last night, whatever, and says, hey, I got a great story for you. Whether you know it or not, the first question in the back of your mind is, who's it about? Who is this story about? Who am I going to pay attention to that's going to take me into this story and I'm going to follow through so I can connect with a human being and enter the world of this story? So in this one, who's it about? There are uh, clearly two players in this story, but if there's one more than the other that we follow from beginning to end, who would that be? Who was it? Want to try again? <laughs> it's actually Carl. From the moment, from the very first shot is him in the bed, you know, with a broken arm, he's kind of miserable. And the very last shot is him walking into the house at the end after she's gone. So he's really the guy that we follow all the way through. Although, look, the two of them are very important. But he's kind of our, our narrative spine to the story. And when we first meet him, he's alone in bed with a broken arm. And then this little girl pops in the window and just rocks his world. And now what does he want? He has a goal. There's something he wants. What is it? Yeah, he wants her. He wants to marry her and raise a family. It's like, you're it. <laughs> the next thing you know after the balloon pops is like they're getting married and they're, they're fantasizing about having a family, which is great, except something happens all of a sudden when they want to have a family. Uh, what happens? What do they find out? Yeah, they find out that they can't have children. Okay, so this big life goal, we're going to get married and have lots of children, all of a sudden we can't. And so how do they respond? Do they, do they just sort of curl up in a ball and die? What happens? What's the next thing? What, is, what does he say to her? Or what does he show her? Right, they want to go on an adventure, right? He says, let's go to Paradise Falls like we had talked about. So that's the new plan. And so they start saving up their money. Okay, and they save up their money, but then uh, something interrupts the, what's the first thing that interrupts that plan? Flat tire. So they smash the change jar to pay for that, but they start saving again. Then what happens? Broken leg, smash the change jar, pay for that. And now they're saving money again. Then what happens? Tree falls in the house, and that's what I like. They're gonna pay for that out of the change jar too. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I wanna live in that world. And in the end, in the end, what happens? She dies. she dies. She dies, right. And he's alone. And so that's not the end of the movie. But if that was the end of the story, if that we say that story's over, what is the meaning of that story? What do we take away from that, that little lesson? What's, what's the, what lesson would you take away? <laughs> That's right. so, somebody said this last week too somebody yelled out life sucks and then you die <laughs> it's like great I want to spend my life with that person <laughs> That's right. come on what's the meaning of the story don't wait exactly if you wait you may never happen so don't put it off till tomorrow carpe diem right now this isn't the whole movie but it is the first six minutes but you see these questions these are the questions so think about a story that you want to tell about your work. And it ha just make sure that it answers these questions. The first question is, who is the story about? I don't care if you want to tell a story about a forest, a community, a policy, an initiative. People don't identify with forests, trees, communities, initiatives, environmental, whatever. People identify with people. So whatever you want to talk about, the first question you've got to answer is, who is the story about? Is it about you? Is it about a landowner? Is it about a government official? Who's the person we're going to meet and follow into the story to learn about forest conservation, uh, new policies, new practices, etc.? That can be ultimately what the story teaches you, but the first question is, who's the story about? Give me a human being to connect with. Without that, your audience is just listening, waiting. Where, where are the people in the story? What do they want? You know, this is going to sound like a gross oversimplification, but just take a moment and think about this. Think about a TV show that you're watching, maybe something you're binging on Netflix. Think about a movie you've seen recently. Think about a book you're reading, a play, whatever. The story basically boils down to who's it about and what do they want? Who's it about, what do they want?
So when you tell a story, right up front, you have to establish, here's who it's about, and here's what they, what they want. Uh, it's about a landowner who wants to learn how to prevent wildfires on their property. Who's it about, and what do they want? Once you know that as an audience, you're ready to take the journey. OK, I know who it's about. I know what they want. Let's see if they get it. Off we go. Now what happens next is critical. This is the thing that makes stories interesting. On the way to the goal, something has to stand in their way. There has to be something that keeps them from getting that thing right away, because if they can just reach out and grab it, there's no story there. Landowner wanted to learn about best management practices. I went in and taught them. They're managing better now. It's all over. Great story. It's right. I'm going to remember that one forever. <laughs> right? I'm taking that one home telling my wife. Um, what makes stories interesting is when you run into a barrier or an obstacle, something that makes the audience go, oh, didn't see that coming, so then what'd you do? And this isn't just me talking, this is evolution talking. And I'm going to prove it to you. We're going to do a short course in human history right now. So just bear with me for a second. Let's jump back in time 100,000 years, okay? It's 100,000 years ago today, okay? You see that, those two cavemen? You see that bush in the distance between them, behind them? Well, 100,000 years ago, on this very day, they turned around and noticed that the bush was shaking. Now, there's no wind. It's not a windy day. There's no reason for that bush to be shaking, but it's shaking. So it's unusual. The caveman on the left looks at the shaking bush, and he thinks this. The caveman on the right sees the very same thing, but he thinks this. And unmoved by this unusual event, the caveman on the right goes his merry way, whistling a merry tune, and a saber-toothed tiger leaps out of the shaking bush and eats him alive. <laughs> right? All right, look, this is anthropology and you're laughing. The caveman on the left, he survives. His DNA gets passed down. We are his descendants. The caveman on the right, <laughs> not so much. So the point is that human beings, homo sapiens, as a species, we have evolved to pay very close attention when something happens that we don't expect. And the translation of that 100,000 years later, when we don't have saber-toothed tigers leaping out of bushes, is that when we tell a story, we need that shaking bush moment. We need that moment in the story where the audience goes, oh, that's unusual, didn't see that coming, so then what'd you do? This is what makes stories interesting. Another way I like to say it is in storytelling. Until I want runs into you can't, you don't have a story. So. How does the person respond to the barrier? Do they come up with some clever way to leap over it, get around it, knock it down? Do they just fold up and go home? What's the response? And maybe there are several barriers in the story. So how do they respond every time? That middle portion there with all those walls, we call that the rising action of the story. The tension is ratcheting up. Is he ever going to get there? Are they ever going to do it? Until finally, what happens? Do we achieve the goal, success, it's a success story, or did something else happen, but there's a clear resolution? You know, in storytelling, if it's about who it's about and what they want, the promise you're making to your audience is at the end of the story, you're going to find out they got it or they didn't, and here's why. And ultimately, what does it mean? What is the lesson that we take away from this? Why do we tell this story? What have we learned here? These six elements, these six questions, this is what your stories need to answer. This is what you need to put the, the test to your stories. So let me show you an example, a real world example. Surfers Healing is a nonprofit organization in Southern California, not far from where I live, that works with children with autism and their parents. And they're going to tell their story right here in 60 seconds. Now, some of you may have seen this before. This is a public service announcement that has aired on ESPN for years. So some of you sports fans out there, you may have seen it. But whether you've seen it before or not, I want you to watch it with new eyes. Because watch how in 60 seconds, they're going to answer all six questions in order. Who's it about? What does he want? What stands in his way to make it interesting? How does he navigate that barrier? Where do we end up? What does it mean? Take a look.
My name is Izzy Paskowitz, and I've been running surf camps for autistic kids for seven years. We get them down to the beach. The kids are going to scream. Some of the kids, they don't know how to speak. The only words that come out of their mouth is screaming. to see that screaming and the kicking when they go out and when they turn around and ride that wave in it just nothing like it and there's a parent tears in their eyes saying man we've had a lot of tough times but today was just a perfect day there you go isn't that lovely so, shout it out. Who is, who is it about? Who's the story about? The kids. I hear you saying the kids. The kids are important, but we're not seeing it from the kids' point of view. We're not connecting with the kids. Who, who's taking us into the story? Izzy, right. Izzy Pasquitz, who happens to be the, the founder of this organization. What does Izzy want? What, do he and, what are he and his team trying to do? Right? Yeah, but even on a simpler level, we're not, we're not curing autism today. We're taking these families who are facing a difficult series of days, and we're just going to give them a great day. We're just going to share the joy of surfing. We're just going to have a fun day. That's enough, OK? That's the goal. What's the barrier? What stands in the way? Fear. Right, autism. You saw the kids kicking and screaming on the beach. The kids don't want to go. That's what they're up against. Kids don't want to go. So how do they respond to that barrier? What do they do? Right, they just take them. <laughs> exactly right. That's right. Yeah. Parents out here, you all know the principle. It's called, we're going. Right? We're just going. And in the end, what happens? Kids have a great day. You saw the smiles. Everyone's having a great day. And the meaning, what does it mean? Well, hint, it's a public service announcement on ESPN. So what meaning do they give it? Yeah, that sports are not necessarily about scores or who won or lost. Sometimes a sport, in this case the sport of surfing, can have a higher value. But again, look at those questions. Who's it about? What do they want? What stands in their way to make it interesting? How do they navigate that barrier? Where do we end up? What does it mean? If your stories will answer all of those questions, chances are you've got a good story to tell. So, last piece. What kinds of stories should you tell? Well. Brainstorming with the, the, the committee that helped to plan this meeting, we came up with five categories. We actually sent out a homework assignment to the people who are coming to the workshop this afternoon. Uh, can you raise your hand? Are you, who's coming to the workshop this afternoon? Hands there, there, there. Good. I don't know if anybody else can join spontaneously if they want, but the homework assignment we gave them was to come up with stories in these categories. A story that will convince landowners that their property needs management. A story showing how to protect a property before wildfires are even in the vicinity. A story showing how trees benefit urban areas. A story showing how healthy trees lead to healthy lives. A story about how forests create jobs and enhance local economies. Now, that may not be everything, but I imagine if you had a bunch of those stories in your back pocket whenever you went out and could pull out the right story at the right time, I imagine this would be a good arsenal for you to have with you a lot of ammunition when you go out to communicate. So that's what we're going to be working on this afternoon. And hopefully we'll have a bunch of stories as a result. And hopefully some of those stories can be shared with you. These can be stories that everyone can use. So that's what we're going to work on. More work to be done. So my understanding is that there's going to be a panel discussion later. Do we have time, Tim, for some questions now or one or two? So look, we talked about three things uh, this morning very quickly. One why storytelling is so powerful, the fact that it helps us remember and can change minds. We talked about how to tell a good story and the six questions your stories must answer. And I briefly gave you an outline of the stories we're going to be working on in the workshop. I'll be here for the panel at like 11.30, I think. But any questions immediately now about anything I talked about that's unclear, anything on your mind, if you don't have a question now, you can come up with it later. While you're thinking, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, if you have found this talk interesting, sorry, I'm going to come back to that. Is it Brett? Let me go to you. Brett, do you have a quick question? No, just a question at the end. That's all. Okay, very good. What, what, do you mean a question? For you, just on the soul. Yeah. I'll, take, I'll take it now. Go. So, so um, there are people in the world that we've all heard from them who think they're really good storytellers. Yes. And there are 
those who aren't? Yes. Is the most common um, uh, self-awareness issue that someone who thinks they're a great storyteller that you have to retrain them into a better one in their making. So, so the question is, what's the, when people think they're great storytellers and they're really not, <laughs> that's right, what, what's the most common problem? Um, it, it's interesting that you asked that because I don't know if there's one most common problem. I mean, I've, I've, uh, I actually have a workshop where we talk about the eight most common mistakes in storytelling. Uh, one of the most common mistakes is what I call too much too soon. The idea being that I want to tell you a story and like the first couple of paragraphs, whether it's in writing or uh, I give you so much detail, you know, that you're just overwhelmed with facts and context and numbers and years, et cetera. And really, the, the responsibility of the first couple of paragraphs of a story is to hook somebody. It's to say something where they go, oh my God, tell me more. So one of the most common mistakes we see is someone says, oh, I've got a great story for you. Let's go back to 1950 when there was 3,000 hectares and blah, blah, blah. It's like, you boom, boom, bored. Even though there's actually a good story hiding in there. So I'll, I'll leave you with that one for now. Um, if you found anything interesting this morning, you want to stay in touch, uh, we do a monthly newsletter called Free Range Thinking, which is only about best practices in communications in the public interest realm, where we all work. Uh, we can send it to you once a month, so if, if today has interested you, uh, please go to my website, thegoodmancenter.com. Uh, if you give us your email address, we'll email this to you once a month, uh, no cost, charge, or obligation, as they say on TV. Um, and we won't do anything else with your email address. We don't market to you. We don't give it to anybody else. You just get this. Also, uh, thanks to a couple of foundations, we wrote a couple of books called Why Bad Ads Happen to Good Causes, a study of public interest print advertising and why a lot of it fails, and the stunning sequel, Why Bad Presentations Happen to Good Causes, why so many people get up on stage with PowerPoint and give so many mind-numbing presentations. Uh, both these books were underwritten by foundations, so they're available for free. So if either title interests you, go to our website. You can download PDFs of either book. In between newsletters, so if I see something fast breaking that I think you should read, watch, whatever, I will tweet about it. So if you want to follow me on Twitter, at Goodman Center, uh, and I'll keep you up on what's up to date in communications. Uh, one more thing before my last thought. Just want to say a big thank you to uh, Tim and Will and Ray and everybody on the, on the planning team. It takes a lot for these things to go so smoothly. So can we have a moment of appreciation again for the planning team? And my last thought, um, since I've been doing this for a long time, I collect stories from all over the world. This one is from uh, a French film company called Canal Plus. Uh, the moral of the story is never underestimate the power of a good story. And of all the stories I had in my library, I picked this one out just for you, and I think you'll see why. Take a look. Ça, chérie Ben oui, c'est fou. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your meeting. Thank you.